Thanks for joining us for today's message. If you'd like to support this resource and others like it, you can do so by visiting our website, thechapel.cc, and select the giving option that works best for you. Enjoy the message. Well, good morning, everybody. You glad you came to church so far? Me too. <laughs> Me too. My name is Pastor Jason. I'm the worship pastor here at the chapel. Uh, my wife, Michelle, and I and our family have been at the chapel for the last four years. Loved every minute of it. Every minute of it. We're very fortunate to call this place our home. We're very fortunate uh, to, call, to call you guys our family. And that's what the chapel is. It's a family, right? Are you guys ready to have a good morning this morning? Because I'm excited. You guys excited? That's what I'm talking about. Well, do you mind? We're just going to jump right in. And I want to start... Uh, with a, just a simple truth, a basic truth that applies to every single person in this room. Are you ready? Here we go. Everybody gets stuck. I don't care who you are, everybody gets stuck. Look at your neighbor and say, you've been stuck before. Okay, let's try that again. Look at your neighbor and say, you've been stuck before. I know that it's true. Listen, sometimes we get stuck in big things. Sometimes we get stuck in little things. Sometimes we get stuck in physical things. Sometimes we get stuck in spiritual things, okay? For instance, anybody ever been stuck in traffic? <sighs> they get progressively worse, bear with me. Anybody ever been to the DMV before? <laughs> AKA the seventh circle of hell. It's a horrible place that nobody should ever have to go to. It's terrible. Uh, what about this? <clears throat> Raise your hand. Have you ever been stuck because you locked your keys in the car? Yeah, I'm amongst friends. Good. Bonus points if you've done it while the car was still running. Twice. Not even joking. But I'm going to share with you today a little pet peeve of mine before we get started. A little pet peeve of mine. And it really, it really uh, concerns me. And by concern, I mean anger. And by anger, I mean I may throw this table. It bothers me that much. Have you ever been stuck at the checkout aisle in a grocery store before? Anybody? Okay. Let me recount my normal experience. I have a whole strategy. I got a whole strategy, people. I got all my stuff. Listen, I'm a man, and so I have a natural aversion to shopping to begin with. So I'm looking for every possible opportunity to get out of the store as soon as possible. And all the guys said, thank you, gentlemen. Very well done. So I get up there, and I start surveying the aisles. You got this long row of, of checkout cash registers and you're just like, okay, which one has the fewest people? And then with those people, how many, how many items does each person have? Like I am so crazy about it. I start doing math in my head, which is a problem because I'm not good at math. Um, and I'm starting to figure out which one will get me out the soonest. And so I pick one, I get in the aisle. I got all my stuff. I feel good about the aisle that I picked. Like I'm ready, I'm ready to put my stuff in. And all of a sudden, the aisle next to me starts to move just a little bit faster than I thought that it would. And I start questioning my decision-making ability, people. I start asking myself, did I make a mistake? And I did. So I took my cart and I went to the other aisle and I parked it in the other aisle. And, and, and wouldn't you know it, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good because things are moving at a good clip. Everybody over there in the old aisle is still stuck. I'm kind of like, <laughs> losers. And I'm excited, but wouldn't you know it, the very last item of the, in the cart of the person in front of me either has a price check problem or the system goes down and it takes the world's slowest person to come and fix it. And so you're stuck. And so you think, okay, I was better off in the other aisle. And so you take your cart and you move it back to the other aisle. And the lady looks at you and says, yeah, I knew you'd be back. But what I didn't notice is that she had flipped off the light for her cash register. And she didn't tell me until I got right there just about to put my stuff. He's like, sir, I need to go on a break. Of course you do. Because I'm here now with my stuff ready to go. Of course, good, you go ahead and take your break. Good. And so I think, you know what? I'm just going to pick a lane and I'm going to stick and I'm going to see it through. So I go back to the, ori the, not the original, the original lane? I don't know, I'm confused. I go back to the other lane and wouldn't you know it, right before I get back, an extreme couponer with two shopping carts full of stuff and a stack of coupons and an unwillingness to budge when it comes to price. I'm stuck. Anybody ever been stuck like that before? 
Let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever been stuck in a situation where every time that you tried to get out of it faster or you tried to make it better your way, it got worse? And who's with me? Okay, good. Again, I'm amongst friends. I like that. See, sometimes we get stuck in silly situations. Sometimes we get stuck in serious situations. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to admit to it, but I'm going to say a couple things. Anybody ever been financially stuck or stuck in anger, stuck in an addiction, stuck in an unhealthy relationship or unforgiveness, stuck with a feeling of loneliness, depression, or loss, stuck with a feeling of guilt or shame or fear or insecurity? Guys, the list goes on. Sometimes it's silly things, but sometimes, guys, it's serious stuff we get stuck into. And these things that we're stuck in, they hurt, don't they? They cause a lot of suffering. They cause a lot of pain. They drain us and keep us completely weighed down. See, all of us at one time or another have just been plain stuck in a situation. And today I want to share a story from the Bible that's going to give us some clues on how you and I can get unstuck. Are you excited? You ready? Here we go. Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 22. If you're taking notes, write that down. Starting in verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. And he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. And a large crowd followed and pressed around him. A large crowd. Verse 25, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When Jesus heard, I'm sorry, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him and he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Your faith has healed you. Everybody say faith. Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. See, this woman had been in a long, exhausting, unsuccessful fight with an issue. For 12 years, she had suffered. Now, here's what I believe about all of us in this room. All of us, at one point or another, have been stuck with an issue that we just can't seem to shake. Maybe it's a big one. Maybe it's a small one. I want you to think right now what that is for you. All of us in this room have struggled with something that's just really hard for us to kick. Some of us have been stuck in unhealthy relationships, unhealthy emotions, unhealthy thoughts, unhealthy habits. See, they've taken a toll and they've cost us dearly and we're exhausted and weak from carrying it so long. I believe a lot of us in here are getting that familiar feeling of, yep, that's me. And guys, I got to be honest with you. Up until yesterday, about an hour before I spoke last night to the Saturday night crowd, I was nervous about speaking this weekend. I was. Guys, you got to understand I believe our lead pastor, Pastor Q, is one of the best communicators I've ever heard in my life. And to stand up on this stage after him is kind of a little bit like, oh my gosh, why am I here? (laughs) But God dropped something into my heart that made me really excited to be here. And it's this simple statement. Everybody gets stuck. Nobody has to stay stuck. That's good news. That's good news. See, God's word has given us an answer to the things that seem impossible for us to get free from. So let's look at the story of this woman. What made her special? How did she get unstuck from an issue of 12 years long? Let's take a look. See, Jesus said very clearly at the last scripture, her faith healed her. 
If you and I ever hope to be unstuck from whatever has kept us suffering, we've got to model the same faith that this woman did. Faith is the answer. Faith is the answer. I've given you the answer. It's awesome. That's it. Faith is the answer. But guys, faith to do what? How did her faith take shape? What action did her faith create? What did she do about it? That's what we're going to discover today. Please, if you're, if you're taking notes, get ready to write this down. If you want to get unstuck, you have, to, you have to have the faith to quit trying. You want to get unstuck, you have to have the faith to quit trying. Write it down. Look at verse 25. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. She had tried everything. She had spent time. She had spent money. She had sought out the, the wisdom of other people. She had tried everything that she knew to do, exhausted every resource and every one of her own methods. Jesus was her last resort. <laughs> See, sometimes we waste a lot of time on our own methods and on the opinions of others, and our struggle ends up getting worse. But when this woman heard about Jesus, something changed. She changed her strategy completely. So I want to be clear about this. I don't want you to quit trying to find the answer. Just quit trying to be the answer. You with me this morning? Don't, don't quit trying to find the answer. Just stop trying to be your own answer. Your methods won't work. Your wisdom isn't enough. Jesus was her last resort. See, what made this woman different is she had come to the end of herself. She finally quit trying to do things in her strength and determined to trust in his strength. Jesus is the only answer. Amen? Jesus is the only answer. He's the answer to your unhealthy relationship. He's the answer to your unhealthy emotion. He's the answer to your unhealthy thought. And he is the answer to your unhealthy habit. Jesus is the answer. But guys, if you're anything like me, I don't want to just talk about an idea. I don't want to just talk about this grand thought. Give me something to do. Let me leave here walking away with some sort of an idea of how do I put this into practice. So here we go. How do you quit trying? Here's the answer. If your answer doesn't completely rely on the power of God, it's the wrong answer. If your answer that comes up in your heart or in your mind doesn't completely rely on the power of God, it's the wrong answer. The absolute wrong answer. You have to, the Bible says to take captive every thought. You have to take authority over the thoughts in your mind and you have to chase that thought out of your head. You gotta quit. Because sometimes when something comes up that we struggle with, especially long-term struggles, we start to say things, well, man, if I could just stop, quit it. Some of us say, well, well, if I could just buy this, then I'd be, quit it. Well, if I could maybe talk to this person or get their idea of what to do, stop, quit. If the answer that comes up in your head isn't completely relying on the power of God, it's the wrong answer. And you've got to take authority over that thought and you have to chase it, actively chase it out of your head. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to trust in God. I'm not going to think about my way. I'm going to trust in God. I'm not going to care about the opinions of others. I have to care about what God says first. You guys with me? Awesome. We have to stop. We have to pray and we have to ask God to help us focus on his perfect way. So that's the first thing. We have to have the faith to quit trying, to quit trying to solve things on our own. But that's not enough to get us unstuck. It's just the first part. Second part is this. We have to have the faith to quit watching. Write it down. There should be note blanks in your, in your bulletin. Quit watching. Look at verse 22. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him, and a large crowd followed and pressed around him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. See, the large crowd surrounding Jesus was there because they were on the way to see him do a different miracle. The story of the miracle with the woman of the issue of blood is a miracle within a miracle. Jesus was on his way to do something else, and he happened upon this lady. But the crowd was around him 
because they wanted to see him do a miracle. They wanted to see him raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. Verse 27, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. See, in this size crowd, why was this woman different? The disciples even laughed Jesus off when, they, when he said, who touched me? Like, Lord, are, are you kidding me right, right now? Everybody touched you. Everybody's pushing you. Everybody's crowding in on you and pressing in on you. He touched everybody, but why did she get healed? What made her different? Hmm. Why was her touch a healing touch? It would seem that motive had a lot to do with it. Everybody say motive. Let's think real quick. Why was every person in that scenario there? Think about the crowd, all that crowd of people. The crowd wanted to see Jesus do a miracle. The crowd wanted to be entertained. The crowd of people was there to be entertained. They were motivated to see what Jesus would do for someone else. But the woman, she didn't want to be entertained. She wanted to be changed. Her motivation was different. She was there not to see what Jesus would do for someone else. She was there to see what Jesus would do for her. And that makes a big difference. Motivation makes a huge difference. So here's the question. Do you want Jesus to entertain you or change you? Each of us have to ask ourselves this question. Am I more interested in being entertained by Jesus or am I more interested in being changed by him? See, because you're either a spectator or a participant. See, spectators watch someone else's game. And they watch from a safe distance. But they can never claim a personal win. Participants, however, engage in their own struggle up close for a chance to reach out for victory. So which one are we? What's our motivation? Do we want Jesus to entertain us or change us? See, some of us are stuck in our struggle because we're content to be in the crowd surrounding Jesus rather than engaging personally with him. And if I can be really honest with you for a minute, that was me. I grew up in church. My dad was a pastor all my life. He was either a worship pastor, senior pastor. I was in church all of the time. And I only turned out a little bit crazy. So, I mean, that's good, I guess. But I loved my time growing up in church. But it was interesting. When I was about 15 or 16, something changed for me. I started to see God change the lives of my friends and other people. And they would be worshiping with their hands lifted. And there was something different and special about that. They would be weeping at the altar because God was doing a deep and important work in their heart and their life. And not only at church did I see a difference, I started seeing a difference out in public. It was a noticeable change, but it wasn't happening to me. And I really struggled with that because I asked the question, God, why not me? Why are they receiving a touch from you? Why is their life changing and mine is not? I was jealous of the work that God was doing in other people. That was really hard for me. Until I realized, well, man, if I want what they have, I have to start doing what they're doing. I'm ashamed to say most of my young life, I was content to be in the crowd that was surrounding Jesus, but never personally connecting with him in any way. I wasn't reading my Bible. I wasn't praying. I was worshiping, but it wasn't from the heart. I was worshiping just to maintain the status quo so nobody would point me out. Guys, I was on the inn. I was a pastor's kid. I knew where all the secret bathrooms at the church were. Like, I knew stuff. I knew. I was on the inside, but I was really on the outside because I didn't do what this woman did. I didn't reach out and connect with Jesus in any way. And when I did, things started to change. See, are we hiding in the crowd 
and going through the motions or are we going through the crowd and putting our faith into motion like this woman did? So again, what do I do about this? What is the action step I can take? How do I quit watching and engage, participate in what God wants to do with me? And here it is. Make your personal pursuit of Jesus greater than your public one. Sometimes we show off our spirituality in front of people so that they think we've arrived at perfect health. Or sometimes we just hide in the crowd around Jesus. We hide at church and hope that no one notices us. But we cannot be healthy until we decide to participate personally in an encounter, a connection with Jesus. We've got to start reading our Bibles. We've got to start praying. And we have to start worshiping from the heart. Those three things are the equivalent of that lady reaching out and grabbing a hold of the edge of Jesus' clothes. That's what we can do to quit watching, to actively engage. Stop being content seeing God do something for somebody else. Start longing for and reaching for what he wants to do in you. Because here's the simple fact. Any amount of time that you spend with God will change you. Not can change you, not might change you, it will change you. Any amount of time will change you. It doesn't always have to be a long, drawn-out process. Apparently, according to this story right here, sometimes all the power we need to be changed forever is in a brief encounter of connecting with God. So to get unstuck, we got to quit trying our way. We've got to quit watching from the crowd. we got to connect with Jesus personally. And then we have to have the faith to quit hiding. Now write that down in your notes. Quit hiding. Make it public. Look at verse 30. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Did Jesus know who had done it? Yeah, of course he did. He said, who touched me? Did he not know? Of course he did. Pastor Q says all the time, when when the Bible, when God or Jesus asks a question, it's not because they don't have the answer. It's because we need the answer. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at Jesus' feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Why did he say that? Your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Why? Wasn't she healed when she touched his robe? Yes or no? Healed. Completely healed. Why did Jesus force the issue and make her come out in public and make her say what had happened? It's not because he needed the worship. It's not because he needed to be puffed up in front of this crowd of people. It's because he knew something about you and me. He knew something about people. That whole encounter was what was about, I'm sorry, that whole encounter was about what was best for her. It's not best for us to keep private the things that God does in our hearts. We have to make it public. You want to know why? Because Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, knows that you and I, when he does something incredible, our tendency is to doubt it. Our tendency is to wonder, "Uh, was that really real? Is what I think God did, did that really happen? We're afraid to believe that it's actually true. That's our tendency. So in his love, Jesus asked, who touched me? And this woman came forth. And she got down on her knees, trembling in fear. And she told the whole truth about what God had done for her. And then Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Be free of your suffering. What Jesus was doing right there is he was closing the door on doubt and fear. He was closing the door to any questions of, "Ah, did Jesus really heal me or was I just having a good day? In his love, he comes behind and he puts his seal of approval on it. 
He took out any questioning, any doubts, any fears. He removed them. He validated her experience. But she had to say what happened in front of the crowd. See, she had tried to make her interaction invisible. She came up behind him. But Jesus knew that that was not what was best for her, to keep this miracle in the shadows. And it's not what's best for you and me to keep quiet about what God's done for us. Jesus sealed it once and for all and validated what happened when she told her story in the crowd. He made it permanent when she made it public. Think about that. He made it permanent when she made it public. Shut the door on doubt and fear. If God has healed you, he has healed you. End of story. And in his love, he'll shut the door on doubt and fear when you make it public. See, there's power in public confession. We have to tell people what engaging with Jesus personally has done for us. We have to do what this woman did. We have to make it public. We've got to tell the whole truth about our faith and his power. It's interesting that you hear this term, the whole truth. God's word is so perfect. It was perfect then and it's perfect now. Because you know what I notice about people when they tell their story? It's always incomplete. It's never the whole truth. People are really willing to say, you know, I just thank God. Thank God for my life that it's changed. Awesome. How did he change it? What's the whole truth? Where are the details? What did he do? See, guys, you got to understand when you share the whole truth of your story, that could potentially change someone's life. Amen. And I've seen it happen the other way, too. Well, let me give you the details of how my life changed. I haven't taken a drink in three years. Awesome. How? Why? What, what happened? It's incomplete. See, some of us are willing to say what has happened but we want to keep the credit for ourselves. But the whole truth would go something like this. I've been drinking for, I'm sorry, I haven't been drinking for three years. I haven't taken a drink in three years. And it's all because of what God has done in my life. That's the whole story. That's the whole truth. See, this story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The beginning, I tried and I failed. That's part of your whole story. When you tell people what's happened to you, you tell them, I tried my own way and I failed. Jesus was my only answer. And then you tell them how you reached out to connect with him like this woman did. That's the middle. But then I started to pray and read and go to church and worship. And I started to apply what his word says about life. And what we know about Jesus is any time spent with him is going to change us. And when he does and when he heals us, we, the third part, the end, we make it public. We declare what our faith and his power have done so that he can shut the door on doubt and fear so that thing can never come back again to haunt or plague you. We gotta tell the whole truth, amen? amen? And here, listen, let me give you some practical things real quick of how you make it public. Guys, get baptized. This is how you quit hiding. You make a public profession of what's going on on the inside of you to the whole world. We got a baptism service coming up in the next couple weeks. Let's do it. Get baptized. Tell the world, I believe in Jesus. He's changed my life. Make that profession. You worship passionately and unashamed. Whether it's inside these walls or outside these walls. Guys, how you live your life matters. How, you're, how you live your life can be an act of worship that people see and they say, hmm, there's something different there. I wonder. You tell a coworker or a family member what God's done in your life. You share your testimony in your small group or your serving team, or you post your testimony online on social media. But make sure you tell the whole truth. I tried and I failed, but then I reached for Jesus. And then he reached back and I am healed completely. You tell the whole story about your faith and about his power. Will you close your eyes? Will you bow your heads? So what do we do when we're stuck in an unhealthy relationship or an emotion or a thought or a habit? We quit looking to our own methods. We quit watching and we connect or reach out and touch Jesus. And we quit hiding by making our faith and his power public to the world around us. That's how we get unstuck.
Everybody gets stuck. Don't be ashamed about being stuck where you are right now. Everybody gets stuck. I get stuck. Pastor Q gets stuck. Everybody gets stuck. But thank God because of his love and his mercy and his power and authority, no one, no one has to stay stuck. Father God, we thank you for the power and the truth of your word. We thank you for the privilege that it is to be called your sons and your daughters. Father, we thank you for the things that we've learned today, the action steps that we've been given. God, give us courage to take them. Or whatever that struggle is that has been plaguing us and causing us to suffer, causing us to be in pain, weighing us down, wearing us down, wearing us out. Lord, we're ready. We're ready to quit trying our way and try your way. You're the only answer. God, we're ready to quit watching from the sidelines and we're ready to quit being content at somebody else's miracle. Lord, we want to be the miracle. Father, we're ready to step out in faith and make your power public and tell the whole truth. We're ready. God, give us courage. Give us wisdom. Father, we thank you for your love and for your mercy and for how every day we can grow because of your word, your love, and your power. We worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Will you stand to your feet, guys? Come on. Hey, thank you so much for letting me share with you guys this weekend. I love you. We'll see you next weekend.